Can you shut that door? Good. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Rory Lantzman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System. Today, we are here to discuss the issue of fair pay and resources for public defenders and prosecutors, particularly the salary disparity that pulls attorneys away from the criminal justice system and into the law department, the education department, and other government agencies. Our criminal justice system depends on talented and experienced public defense attorneys and prosecutors to ensure justice and fairness for complainants and defendants. Public defenders make sure that the right to counsel is more than just an empty promise, so we cannot shirk our responsibility to adequately fund their representation of New Yorkers. And experienced, savvy, committed assistant district attorneys are necessary to faithfully exercise their immense discretion and ethical obligations. In short, the issue of experienced, professional, dedicated public defenders and prosecutors is a key criminal justice reform issue. Yet it is becoming increasingly difficult for public defenders and prosecutors' offices to retain talented and experienced public service attorneys to perform these critical responsibilities. Low pay, high cost of living, and crippling law school debt are among the many factors these offices cite as reasons retention and recruitment cannot keep up with staffing requirements. We constantly hear stories of public defense attorneys and assistant district attorneys leaving for other city agencies for better pay and lower caseloads. Yet starting salary for entry-level attorneys at some public defenders and prosecutors' offices lag behind the law department. And that difference continues across the years, at the three-year mark, the five-year mark, and the 10-year mark. The starting salaries information that we have for public defenders range from 61,000 to 68,000, while the law department starts at 68,000, for example. At the three-year mark, the public defenders range from 64,000 to 66,000, with the law department at 71,000, and Department of Education attorneys in the administrative trials unit at $85,000. At five years, legal aid, public the Brooklyn defenders and New York County defenders range from 70,000 to 78,000, with the law department at 79,000. And at 10 years, the public defenders range from 87,000 to 96,000, while the law department is at over 108,000. It therefore comes as no surprise that city agencies often have better retention rates than our district attorney offices and indigent service providers. My bill, Intro 514, would establish a temporary task force to study the issue of pay parity for public defenders and prosecutors. Not because we don't know the problem and its solution. We know both the problem and its solution. We've been talking about this for many years now. But because we have struggled to get the administration to focus on this issue and promose a, promose, propose a systematic, lasting solution. I look forward to hearing today from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, our public defenders, the district attorneys, about their funding, retention, strategies, and salary needs. With that, I uh, welcome the um, Director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, uh, Liz Glazer. And um, Ms. Glazer, if you and whoever else is, is testifying uh, would get sworn in, we can, we can get started. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Lanceman, and uh, thanks, Council Member Cohen. Um, my name is Elizabeth Glazer. I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'd like to introduce my colleagues, uh, Debbie Grummet, who's the director of our budget office in my office within Bakshe, and Erin uh, Pilniak, who is the deputy director for uh, crime control. Um, the mayor's office of criminal justice, as you know, advises the mayor on public safety strategies uh, and together with partners inside and outside of government develops and implements policies that promote safety and fairness and reduce unnecessary incarceration. 
Um, as you know, New York City has the lowest crime and incarceration rates of any large city in the nation. Major crime has fallen by 78% in the last 25 years and 13% in the last four. And 2017 was the safest year in ComStat history with homicides down 13% and shootings down 21% since the year before. And this is a success that's shared in uh, and contributed to by all our partners in government and all New Yorkers. Since the beginning of the mayor's administration, the jail population has declined 27%, the steepest four-year decline since 1998. And the number of people in city jails has fallen across almost every category. The number of people held on bail under 2000 has fallen around 60%. The number of people serving city sentences about 28% and the number of 16 and 17 year olds by about 50%. Justice system partners, including district attorneys, indigent defense providers, and law enforcement, along with nonprofit providers and all New Yorkers have been critical to these achievements. To support this work, my office works with OMB to invest public resources to help create the safest possible New York City with the smartest and fairest justice system. The district attorneys and indigent defense providers play vital, although different roles uh, in the city and the success of many of our initiatives involve working with them. While we make recommendations and share strategies with the district attorneys, each DA is an independently elected official. They set their office's priorities and develop initiatives. The needs of each office are as unique as the communities they serve and annually each district attorney submits needs requests to MACJE and OMB. MACJE and OMB then work to make investments that are responsive to community e needs and can aid prosecutors and defenders in ways that will improve the fairness and effectiveness of our criminal justice system. Historically, fluctuations in funding have been a byproduct of providing incremental increases over the years in response to uh, those needs requests. We make concerted efforts to provide such funding and have significantly supported the DAs over the past four years. This administration has increased the overall budget from 287 million in uh, fiscal year 14 when the mayor took office uh, to 383 million in fiscal year 19. And salaries are one part of this whole picture. Over the past two fiscal years, we've engaged with each district attorney's office on issues of salary parity. Each office has its own hiring and recruitment practices, salary structure and retention rates. And during the same period, we also funded and supported a significant range of programs at the DA's offices, increasing staffing and enriching the office's resources. In this past fiscal year, we were able to work with the DAs to provide parity with the law department for starting salaries in years one through five, and we're engaged in active discussions with each of the DAs' offices aimed at better understanding their operations and evaluating their funding needs. We equally value the critical and constitutionally grounded role played by public defenders in the criminal justice system and in our city. These dedicated providers are integral to the sound functioning of our justice system and to advancing fairness and the dig dignity of all New Yorkers. Consistent with the city's commitment to fund indigent pro defense providers, we have both increased funding and responded to particular needs requests. Public defenders and district attorneys play equally important but different roles in our criminal justice system. The mechanisms to fund their work differ as well. Indigent defense provider funding is provided through a process in which services are solicited through requests for proposals. And this process involves application of city procurement rules, a series of ongoing discussions and contract negotiations. New contracts for indigent defense providers to begin next year are in process and we expect the contracts to be registered by January 1. Given that we are in, uh, have not yet reached fin finality on the upcoming contracts, I'm unable to provide further comments on the indigent defense salary structures. We look forward to entering into these new contracts and to funding the ongoing work of the city's public defenders. I'm aware that the council has proposed a temporary task force on pay parity among public defenders, assistant district attorneys, and city agency attorneys. At this time, we're still examining this issue uh, and have not reached a position as to the necessity or potential scope of such a task force, especially given our ongoing engagement with the DAs and the indigent defense providers. Thanks for the 
opportunity to speak today and for your continued support and partnership in the transformative justice system reforms that are changing our city. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me mention we've also been joined by Council Member a Andrew Cohen from the Bronx and Council Member uh, Debbie Rose from Staten Island. Um, you've, you've given us data, a, um, a chart uh, comparison, comparing the uh, salaries for the law department with the various DA's offices. We had also asked for, which I appreciate, we had also asked for uh, uh, salary comparisons for the Department of Education lawyers and Department of Correction lawyers. Do, do you have that? I don't have that today. Um, that's something that we're working on and can uh, work on providing to you. Um, it's a slightly different, uh, it's a little bit more difficult um, to collect that information because um, the lawyers are sprinkled throughout those departments doing different functions. Um, they're very different from uh, the way in which certainly the DAs are constructed. All right, so let's, I, I want to get into how the, the mayor forms the, the, the budget, uh, the preliminary budget for the district attorneys and how your, um, your office and the administration um, starts uh, with forming the, the, the periodic RFPs for the, the public defense providers. But, but I want to start with a, a, more, a more, more basic question, and I just want to make sure we're, we're understanding if we're even all on the same page. The district attorneys and the public defenders have testified in the past, and, and they're going to testify after you, that they are having a very, very difficult time recruiting and retaining lawyers, and that they are losing many of their lawyers, not just to the private sector, but also to other government agencies, city government agencies. Do you agree with the basic uh, 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 premise that the district attorneys and the public defenders are having a very difficult time recruiting and retaining qualified lawyers? You know, I don't, I, I've certainly heard and we've engaged uh, with the DAs um, and heard those stories as well and obviously the testimony previously um, about their difficulty in both attracting and retaining lawyers. Um, we ourselves have looked, um, sort of started to take that look at what retention looks like to see compared to what. Um, it's been difficult for us to really um, get to the bottom of what is actually causing, if in fact there is that difficulty in, in attracting lawyers, and if in fact there is that difficulty in retaining lawyers um, compared to other public interest uh, entities. Uh, and we hope to have some more information on that and understanding that better uh, with respect to sort of what retention rates look like, but I don't have that right now. Well, what would you need more from them? Because, again, they have testified yeah. at hearings that, that you have been at, mm -hmm. and I've heard this for the, as long as I have been the chair of the, the, the committee, mm -hmm. and I haven't really seen it challenged in any um, uh, quantitative way. So what, what information would you need to be able to assess whether or not the district attorneys and the public defenders are correct in saying that they've got a recruitment and, and retention problem, especially vis-a-vis -vis other public uh, agencies. Yeah, so um, we're involved right now in what I think are very productive conversations with the DAs. We've gotten some information from some of the DA's offices on what their retention rates look like. Um, we've certainly heard the stories also. They don't totally comport with what our initial look is at our own, for example, Corp Council. There are different um, ways that people define what retention is, and so that can sort of wildly skew the numbers. Uh, and so that's something that we hope to have some kind of uh, understanding of you know, as we look at this information together. So every year, the mayor produces a preliminary budget 
we have hearings and executive budget and the budget gets gets passed and periodically you have these RFPs which you're in the midst of or hopefully at the at the end, at the end. of concluding finally let's start with the with the district attorneys right the mayor puts out numbers in the preliminary budget what analysis or assessment is done of the recruitment and retention needs that uh, 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 um, results in, in, in the administration and the mayor putting out X tens of millions of dollars for this office and X tens of millions of dollars for that office for, for the DAs. So if only it were thus, but it's not. Um, the way in which our budget process know, uh, works, as you know, um, is that we start from a historical base, meaning whatever it is the DA's got last year or the year before, and it's a reflection of many years of, of needs and discussion, um, is where we start from. And it's an incremental process in that each year the DA's come forward and say, um, I have these needs, um, and we then discuss with them um, those individual needs. So, you know, the issue of vertical prosecution or the Rikers Bureau with respect to um, the Bronx, uh, conviction integrity units in a number of different DA's offices, DV uh, issues. So a whole array of things that have to do with everything from personnel to um, to tech needs and other things. So it's really based on the individual asks, that's where we start from, of each uh, DA's office, and then dis funding decisions are made based on a discussion with them. So over time, and I don't want, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, before you or Mayor de Blasio and I were here, the DA's had a budget, and Without maligning any of our predecessors in government, that budget probably reflected as much political push and pull and realities as it did any kind of systematic analysis of the, of the budgetary needs of the district attorney's offices. And then the mayor comes into office, I come in the office, you would take your responsibilities. Wouldn't it make sense to do some kind of professional, thoughtful, analysis of what do these offices really need for the work that they're expected to do and, and the salaries that their, uh, their um, assistants and, and, and support staff need. Which, so that's, uh, can that's, we do that? That is a great question um, and, I, and worthy of thought. It is a question as to uh, I, I think it's whether or not actually that would benefit or not the DAs, whether the DAs would want to do what essentially you're suggesting is a kind of zero-based budgeting. Okay. Uh, and that could uh, result in significant shifts in the way in which, um, in the number of people that the DAs have uh, and the amount of money that they have. So you, it's you, a very you would file that in, in the category of be careful what you ask for in terms of the DAs, uh, uh, potentially. I would, I would flag that. Um, I mean, I would note that, you know, we take very seriously the, uh, the needs of the DAs um, and of the defenders. This, off, this administration has been remarkably generous, uh, in my view, uh, with respect to um, I, providing the DA's resources, um, you know, over the last four years, I, I would be very surprised if, if there was as steep an increase in the resources and funding of the DA's as we've seen in this administration. Uh, anywhere from 22% uh, increases to 78% increases in their, in their, uh, in their budgets. Um, and that's covered a whole array of things, including sort of systemic shifts in the way DAs, often incoming newly elected DAs, have wanted to shape their offices to new initiatives uh, that they had been interested in funding. 
So I think it speaks to two things. One, the administration's commitment to make sure that we have a fair functioning system. And two, a partnership that we think has been fruitful um, with the DAs and with the defenders in trying to uh, shape as fair a system as we can uh, achieve in New York City. You know, the, from, from my side of the table, I find the budget process to be very um, ad hoc. And again, we're, we're sticking with the DAs now. We're going to get to the public defenders. Um, you know, I sit with each of the DAs or their staffs each budget cycle, and I, I even did that before I had the, the DAs technically under my jurisdiction. Um, and, you know, they want a program for this, they want a program for that, and these are all things that we want them to do because, by and large, they all represent some kind of criminal justice reform agenda that we support. And, and all of them also talk about kind of the fundamental, I want to say baseline, that is a particular term in the budget, but I don't mean it that way. Like, we've got to pay our, pay our staff. And um, I know this isn't a budget hearing, but we're talking about those kinds of issues. It's very, very frustrating that we've got to balance or juggle paying or, or providing funding for them to meet the, the, the minimum that is necessary for them to, to pay their assistance and keep their assistance and, and, and not lose them versus, all right, well, who's going to pay for the conviction integrity unit in Staten Island? Who's going to pay for vertical prosecution here, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so, I, yes. I, I mean, I'm going to divine the question. Go ahead. And uh, I answer it in this way, um, because I think it's an excellent point. Um, I think that there are two separate but converging things going on that we have to address. One has to do with salaries and ensuring that both our DAs and defenders are paid adequately in a way that permits them to do their job at the highest level. The second has to do with how many people are needed to do that job and in what areas. And I, I, the reason why I say those are separate things but converge is that you could imagine a world in which um, we did something closer to what you're suggesting uh, and we have a very transparent look each year at what DAs are spending uh, and on what, um, how many heads they've been able to hire and whether or not uh, there should be a shift in using money for one initiative instead of using, if it's not being used fully in one initiative, to potentially allocate that to salary. So, but I think these are two separate things, um, but they're two separate things that ultimately come together in a way that I think is complicated, uh, and it's part of, of the conversation that we're having now with the DAs. Let's talk about the public defenders now. Um, and I'll start with uh, a, a fact that, is, that, I, that I believe is true, I see it as true, and is very, very painful for public defenders. I hear it from them in person, I hear it from them through social media, that in a courtroom where they are providing the service and the function that is literally required by the Constitution, they are the lowest paid professional in the room. Is that something that troubles the administration? So, again, we have an issue where the process that we are bound to has shaped what the salary structures look like. So we've just discussed how it is that we go about the DA's funding request. The indigent defense providers are funded in a very, very different way. So that's part of an RFP process that happens over, you know, over a series of, um, you know, every six, six years, I think it is. Um, and so we put out a proposal. We solicit responses to it. We then 
so the, the defenders themselves provide to us, this is what we think um, you know, it should look like. We then have a negotiation with them about it, um, and that's how we get to a conclusion. They're also funded quite differently than the DAs. Um, so the DAs are almost entirely funded by city funds. Um, that's not true and will be even less true as we go on um, over the next few years because of significant infusions of state funds from the Harrell Herring settlement uh, and from uh, ILS funding more generally. And so I think what we are going to see over the next few years is that that combination of funding is going to actually converge the amount of funding for the DAs and the amount of funding for the defenders will in fact converge. What do you mean the amount of funding will converge? I don't, I don't know that I understand. Meaning that the total amount that's provided to support the district attorneys and the total amount of funding provided to support our defenders will be very, very close. Well, that would entail, if I'm not mistaken, a very significant increase in the amount of funding that are going to the defenders. Right, and it looks like that's what we're seeing from Harrell Herring and from um, other pieces coming in, mm -hmm. as well as, although I can't get into the details until the contract is public, okay. as well as uh, a city infusion of funds. Okay, well, for what it's worth, the public defender community behind you are all vigorously shaking their heads or looking at me quizzically, but we'll they'll have their chance to, to speak. So um, when you say that their funding mechanisms are or, or different, I, I understand that, that that's true. There's an RFP every six years, but it's, but it's the administration that puts out the, the RFP and it's the administration that negotiates that, that RFP. And, and you say that you're limited in what you can say about the current RFP and where it stands and, and its closure and et cetera. Um, but is there any analysis that's done or any effort or, or do you start with the proposition when you, when you put out that RFP that we're gonna fund it starting with, we're gonna make sure that the public defenders standing up in courtrooms across the city every day are going to be uh, compensated at the same level as, as other government attorneys and, and then we'll build from there. Mm -hmm because I don't, I don't know what's gonna be with this RFP, but uh, I sus suspect it's, it's not gonna take the public defenders, or if it does, I'd be pleasantly surprised from where they are now to, to, to this concept of parity. Um, but when you're crafting the RFP, do you start with, okay, here's how much it's gonna take to pay these hundreds of public defenders the salary they need to, to do this work, pay their student loans, and, and make a career of this? So there's, there is quite a bit of analysis that goes into the crafting of the RFP and also with the negotiation with the indigent prevent, uh, defense providers afterwards, and I'll give you just the top lines, and then uh, Debbie, my budget director, who's been very involved, can maybe add to it if I miss something. I'm sure I will. Um, so we take a look at uh, certainly caseloads uh, and uh, what the trend lines are in uh, both misdemeanors, felonies, and homicides. Homicides, as you know, is a separate contract. Um, we take a look at, um, in this case, we looked at both our defenders um, in New York City and defenders across uh, the nation to understand not just uh, the staffing needs with respect to lawyers, but also the significant need for social service providers and other kinds of skill sets that are important in the defender's work. And all of that goes into um, the RFP. Do you wanna add to um, that? Sure, we looked at the, oh, sorry. <laughs> we looked at the proposals that were for specific caseloads and the proposals included staffing levels as well as salaries. Um, what was working in opposite directions was the acknowledgement for increased ancillary services combined with declining caseloads. And so the net of that, we did see an increase of overall funding provided at a time of declining caseloads. 
The RFP has certain core values, core missions, core goals. Let's say those core goals reflect the values and, and, and missions. Um, why can't one of them be that public defenders will get salaries that are um, uh, on parity with other government employees, government attorneys? Because that doesn't seem to be a core um, baseline for for how these RFPs are, are let out and, 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 and negotiated. Uh, we did not specifically address salary parity as one of the criteria of the RFP. Um, we looked at a proposal for a given caseload, um, acknowledging again a certain staffing model that was consistent with what the state standards were, as well as the acknowledgement of the need for additional ancillary services. We also took measures to weight the caseload to more appropriately reflect the workload of felonies versus treating all cases the same, but we did not specifically highlight salary parity. I, uh, let me just mention we've been joined by Councilmember Alan Maisel and Councilmember Andy Cohen has questions. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm not sure I can do as good a job as you, but uh, I do want to follow up on, uh, on some of this. Uh, <coughs> you know, my background is on the civil side, but I think as just a typical New Yorker, I, I can't see how you would not have the perception that if the DA, at, you know, sitting on that side of the table is making X, and your public defender is making X minus, that you don't have as good an attorney. Like, that just seems like a very corrosive uh, environment that uh, I think is indisputable. Like, it just the way, you know, pe people's mind works. Like, my lawyer is worth less than their lawyer. Like, I, the system already has, you know, it's thumb on the scale right then and there. And, and you could in just incorporate in the RFP that we want the, the uh, defenders to make X. That's a requirement of the RFP, and that's the end of it. This problem could be solved in one. Uh, but I, I, I'm curious to see how you feel about the perception that the public defenders are making less uh, than the ADAs, and if you think that that has a negative corrosive effect. Um. So I guess, um, you know, in an ideal world, we would have, you know, perfect salary parity across many different, um, many different aspects of the profession. Um, I think to some degree we have, you know, built on the past um, and that has gotten us to where we are. Um, I take your point. Uh, that's not the way this RFP ended up um, working out. Uh, as I mentioned, there are going to be some significant other infusions of money over the next few years. Um, but even so if we were a minority stakeholder, we could still, because we're a significant stakeholder, we could say that we're not going to contract with you unless you pay your public defenders X, mm -hmm. even as a minority stakeholder in, the, in, in, in payment. Yeah, we're still a majority stakeholder. So. I really, uh, you know, it, it, it just seems to me that as a cornerstone, I mean, you know, you, you know, when I hear about things in Alabama and the public defender, you know, doing this part time and, you know, it just, this is New York City and I, I, I feel that the, it, 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 there's no other greater evidence of sort of the lack of balance and justice when, you know, the pay levels are, it would just, it's just such a clear statement that we value this work less than that work. And that's really not, you know, in 21st century New York, I just don't feel like that's the statement we want to make. And I can't believe that that's the statement this administration wants to make. And it's, you know, there's, for all of us, the clock is ticking here, but there is time to do something uh, about that. And I really would encourage uh, us to do that. And, and even, to, you know, I'm going to sign on to, uh, unless I'm on it already, I'm going to sign on to uh, Councilmember Lansman's bill because, you know, I'm a strong advocate for my DA. I want to see, you know, my DA get the resources that she needs to do as good a job. But if there's, you know, just because there's a historical structural flaw, like, like this is our opportunity to do the right thing and fix it. Why don't we do that? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, no, I that's why we're that. here, right? Yep, I appreciate that. All right. Thank you, Chair. Debbie? Council Member Rhodes. Thank you, Chair. Um, along with, the, in, in the same vein, um, how is it that the inequity um, arrives between, you know, the 
the ADA, the DA's office, and the indigent service providers. Um, where do they start? Is it is it at the starting salary level, and it just incrementally is is so diverse that it's it creates this disparity? So I think it's everybody builds on the past, uh, and so unless we take apart each system and then build up from kind of a zero base, it's. That's so where we there's are. no base and that, base that, pay for um, starting ADAs and um, public indigent, you know, service workers. Um, there's not a base. So, with respect to the DAs, mm -hmm. um, although we provided the uh, anal. anal uh, analogous salary of sort of court counsel one through five, um, that doesn't really reflect the way those decisions are made within each office. So each office can decide what its starting salary is, um, what the bumps up are, uh, how various people are compensated. Um, but we use that as a way to just, as a rough measure, uh, to try and get to some parity. And so that's based on, um what each uh, DA's office um, is allocated, right? So each. what we did was we looked at, um, as best we could, um, the what looked like each class. So you know, as you know, DA's offices hire in chunks in a first year, and usually they kind of move through the system. So we tried to look at um, at how those salaries clumped in years one through five. We then looked at Corp Council to try and see if we could see an analogous clumping as far as the dollars went. And then uh, we tried to uh, equalize it across, uh, across the offices to come up with a dollar amount. So if their budgets are, but if their budgets are not equitable, then that the funding, the, the money is not equitable, right? Well, if, if my DA gets less than the Bronx DA, how does my DA, how is my DA able to pay their, um, their staff? Well, at, your DA got a 78% increase in their budget since the beginning of the administration. Just uh, specifically, yes, because and then, we, and we then, have we we fought hard for that. And we then, fought hard for that, and mm -hmm. and then within that, the issue is the DAs have a lot of discretion about how to allocate the money that they get with respect to salary. So there's uh, how do we decide what it is we're going to do with respect to getting to parity? And I've described to you the method that we did with one through five. But once the DAs get that money, they're independently elected officials, they allocate their budgets. So it's discretionary like. by, uh, according to DA's offices, that's what you're the saying? DA, the DA's have a budget, uh, and they allocate it how they like, and you'll see that when you look at, you know, the different decisions the DA's have ma made, for example, as to, you know, what their starting salaries are. And since we've increased their, um, the, their, their funding allocation, um, are they at equal par with um, outside attorneys? Or, and if not, how much, where's the disparity? How much is the, the range between um, ADAs being paid what outside, you know, starting attorneys? Private attorneys? Well, I mean private attorneys? Yeah. Well, with respect to private attorneys, all of us could be supported on the salary of a private attorney. I mean, it is <laughs> out of sight. <laughs> so, um, so we try. But, but we are talking about trying to um, accomplish some level of parity so that we can retain the, totally. the skilled attorneys that. No, totally you know, appreciate that. And that's what I'm, and so, 
I think we're all so struggling. What, what is that? Yeah. What is the gap yep, yep. in order to so I think um, allow us to maintain the, um, the skill sets that um, we need in the So power. that, we've sort of taken the first step in that exercise, which is years one through five, mm -hmm. and that's what I was describing to you of trying to figure out some analogous salary structure in the public sector. DAs have, have you know, told us stories, as I think the chair mentioned, you know, that they lose people to court counsel, so that seems, it's to some degree that, you know, is roughly analogous kind of work. Um, we're now engaged in what I think are very productive conversations with the DAs about what happens next. Um, it becomes more complicated after year five because the salary structure is all over the place within offices um, and also between offices. So I don't have a good answer for you about where that, where that will end up. That's part of what the ongoing discussions are. So have we accomplished, I'm trying to yeah, figure yeah. out if we've accomplished that, you know, year one to five Correct. year range. Are we at parity now? Oh, yeah, so in the July, in the adopted, uh, we provided 5.4 5. 5. 5. 4, yeah. 5. 4 million dollars um, in order to do that parity between uh, the DA's offices and one through five. And when a diversion program is created in the DA's office, um, is there an automatic allocation of additional funds to indigent service providers um, that would have clients that would be in these programs? No, they're, the budgets are not tied in that way. They're not. Um, do you think that that's something that you should be looking at? So um, the indigent defense providers are not shy about asking f for and uh, for uh, uh, separate funding for different kinds of efforts. Uh, so one of the things that I think has been, you know, a big success has been the decarceration project that we're doing with uh, the Legal Aid Society, uh, and there have been a number of other examples like that. Um, but there isn't a one-for-one -one connection. But because it's an adversarial um, system, don't you think that there needs to be parity there? So I guess the question is, um, so for example, there's a very robust citywide diversion program uh, called supervised release. And the city spends, initially it was funded by DA Vance actually, and now the city spends uh, quite a bit of money on that diversion program. It is part of the, um, so, so we're funding the program. It's part of what a lawyer does, whether a defender or a prosecutor, in the course of a court case uh, to determine whether they're recommending a client for the diversion program. So usually what happens is the funds actually go to a diversion program. It goes to the program, but it goes to um, one side for the prosecution, right? The prosecution is no. I no. think um, I think so. We've funded um, in Manhattan, and I believe in one other, in Brooklyn, I believe uh, alternatives to incarceration units. And I think what those guys are doing are actually helping to run programs that divert people. I mean, the role of a DA is becoming more diffuse <laughs> and less about, um, you know, just simply the prosecution of a case. Mm -hmm. And so programs can be funded through DA's offices. They can be funded citywide, like supervised release, which is, you know, taken in about 10,000 people since mm -hmm. 2016. And that's done through nonprofits. Uh, serving the courts, uh, the defenders so and DAs our and indigent clients. service providers are getting additional resources for diversion programs. Uh, uh, so I'm not, the programs, when, diversion when, programs uh, let me, are Let funded, me ask the question yeah, again. Sorry. When the diversion program is created in the DA's office, mm -hmm. is there an automatic allocation 
of additional funds to indigent service providers that would have clients in these programs? No, but I think it's two separate things. One is the actual program services, right, which are run by, you know, a nonprofit or whatever that provide those services. The defenders in the ordinary course of representing their client will determine whether or not they want to recommend their client for an alternative to detention or alternative to incarceration program, and the judge will then make that decision. I, I think the suggestion But I may be yeah. just, I think we may be talking past each other. Oh, I'm not I, sure I'm totally I think, I think, so. I think the, the suggestion, if I may, is that these alternative programs are all good and we support them and we fund them where they can, but they do require additional effort and work on the part of the public defenders to get their clients into those programs, to make sure that they're uh, maintaining themselves in those programs, to defend them if they mm -hmm. run afoul of one of the rules of, of the programs. The, the programs create work not just for the, for the prosecutors, but they create work for, for everyone. Yeah. And I think we'll hear later, we've heard it many times, but we'll certainly hear later, that there's no increase in funding or there's no recognition of that extra burden and responsibility that the public defenders have because of all these wonderful programs that we all support. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that's fair. And again, you know, we're always open to hearing from and have, you know, worked with the defenders on an array of programs separate from the contract, like decarceration, like warrant clearing, uh, a whole array of things um, that are separate from what's in the contract, um, but are separate programs, separately funded for them. Thank you. Uh, I'm the only non-lawyer on this <laughs> committee. You did a magnificent job. I, I don't speak legalese, so. Uh, I thank, barely do either. So. Thank you for translating. Uh, no, you, thank you. Thank you. Um, before you go, I just want to drill down on, on, on the, the bill. And not everybody, even in the criminal justice reform community, is, is in love with the idea of, let's give ourselves a year to figure this out. Yeah. I respect that. We're going to hear from that. but. Why not have a task force, appointees of the different stakeholders, in a room with a mission and in a timetable, come up with a solution and a, and a fix for this? Because I think that, that you would acknowledge this is an issue that's been talked about for, for many, many years. And you know, say in fits and starts, we, we, we look at it and we address it and we try to apply a Band-Aid here or there. Why not get everyone in a room with a mission and a timetable and an expectation of coming out of that with a plan mm -hmm. for how we're gonna fix this. No, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I think that we're involved in extremely productive uh, discussions right now with the DAs. I hope we'll come to conclusions. Um, you know, we started last summer uh, with the DAs on this. Um, we now sort of have that one through five. You know, it may not be perfect, but uh, it's a start. Um, so I think it would be good if we could get to conclusion through that process. We're obviously, you know, looking at your bill and very interested in, you know, the concept put forth there. But uh, we're very hopeful that we can get to conclusion. Um, well, thank you very much for your, for your testimony. I know you are very, very busy. Um, if you were to stick around for the next panel, you would, I think, find it um, interesting. We're going to have the district attorneys and the, the head of legal aid's uh, criminal defense practice uh, testify jointly in the same panel, the same time. It's, it's going to be groundbreaking. That's a beautiful thing. All right. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we'd like to invite um, uh, District Attorney Darcel Clark, uh, Mike McMahon, and Jack Ryan, representative from the Queens District Attorney's Office, and Tina Luongo from uh, legal aid to testify on our next panel.
a big boss. Yo, no, I'm sure. Why don't you just run the deck on you guys? I just, they may, may need me. Do you mind if they're taping me? Do you mind if I sit there? Do you mind if I sit there and just use I don't care. Good. How are you? Like they wanted to move yeah, down. Yeah. Okay, Jack, how are you? Are That's you all. Good, sir. How are yeah, you? Yeah, no, I'm okay. We have to move down. Okay, how okay. far? They were great. Huh? Mm -hmm. Can I have one of those, though? I'm too big, but yeah. Thank you. You know, I saw your article. I saw your article. Oh, it has to, yeah. Okay. Hi, Jim. How are you? Good. Oh, gosh. Where's Odell? Is she sitting? Uh, I put her in the back. She's going to go to home. Home on the All right, if we could just swear you in and then we will get started. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Um, Judge Clark, if you'd like to begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Lansman and members of the Justice System Committee. It is an honor to appear before you today. Uh, I last appeared before you on May 14th to make the case for parity for my assistant district attorneys. The five months since, and the summer in particular, have been remarkable for both the sheer number and scope of serious cases my office has been handling and the community outreach we have done to enhance trust in our office and the criminal justice system. We've seen a rise in homicides, we have 75 so far this year, surpassing the number we had for all of 2017, which was 72. The Bronx has 30% of the city's homicide, while it is home to 17% of the city's population. Behind these numbers are people whose cases have gripped the city and even the nation. 15-year-old Lissandro Jr. Guzman Feliz, brutally slain on video that went viral. Lisa Marie Velasquez killed and dismembered when she tried to help a friend. And Valerie Solis, particularly butchered by her husband. While continuing, while continuing to investigate and prosecute these cases and many others that don't make the headlines, in July, my office held a silent peace march to the site of a triple homicide with community leaders, police, and clergy present. Last month, we held a re-entry resource fair for those coming back to the community from prison, 
hundreds of people receive information about jobs, health care, and housing. We sponsored a 5K run to start Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We held a gun buyback. And in the last year, our Crime Victims Assistance Unit widened its scope and served 423 loved ones and relatives of homicide victims, 90 more than the previous year, as well as um, over 1,800 more domestic violence victims than last year. Lastly, our Overdose Avoidance and Recovery Program won praise nationally and continues to save lives. 45 people completed treatment and were diverted from the criminal justice system. In this turbulent time of criminal justice reform, my ADAs never cease to amaze me with how well they perform their jobs amongst great changes and challenges. And despite being the lowest paid in the city, we face new hurdles undaunted and committed to improving the criminal justice system. Since I last appeared before you to ask for pay parity, 50 ADAs left my office. 10 obtained positions in the New York City Law Department, the Family Law Unit, which is gearing up to meet the challenges accompanied by the Raise the Age legislation. Over the past year, 105 ADAs left the office. 31 of them went to city, state, and federal agencies, including the Law Department, DOE, DOI, ACS, and other DA's offices, the State Attorney General, the Governor's Office, ICE, the, and the U.S. Attorney's Office, as well as DOJ. With 516 attorneys currently on staff, the result is an attrition rate near 20 percent. As I have testified before, the most significant staffing challenge we face is recruiting and retaining an adequate number of attorneys to stabilize our legal workforce. The other problem is that as a result of attrition, our average experience level continues to drop. Currently, the average experience level of an ADA in my office is three years, eight months. And that is not significant experience to handle complex investigations and felony cases like homicides. To meet this challenge, we have invested in training our newer assistants. However, this training and experience will not yield long-term benefit for us if our attorneys continue to take jobs in the private sector or in other agencies for higher pay. Further, attrition has a destabilizing effect on the cases we are charged with prosecuting. Persistent reassignment of cases undermines the intent and benefits of vertical prosecution. Lost productivity and duplicative reassignment of cases cost an estimated $3.7 million this year. Last March, I asked for $6.3 million so my assistants would be paid a salary equivalent to prosecutors in other city and state offices. The city, through the good graces of you, the council, gave us $2 million for parity last summer. But that money was earmarked for ADAs with one to five years uh, in the office. That meant, in some cases, newer assistants would make more than some ADAs who have been in the office longer. But with a lot of hard work by my financial team, we worked out the numbers to bring salary levels on par with attorneys and ADAs and other agencies. Effective September 4th, starting with the 2018 class, I raised the starting salary of ADAs to $65,000 and $69,000 upon admission to the New York State Bar, which mirrors the starting salary of the New York City Law Department, or so we thought. Recently, we were informed that the Law Department salaries increased in September to attract attorneys hired for Raise the Age. Now, if that is true, and I'm not sure that's true or not, um, if that is true, then we're back in the same place we were before. The attrition and salary parity question is even more alarming if it comes to pass that the remaining funding we requested for complete parity, another $4 million, will not be forthcoming in the November budget. 
This means the salary compression for assistants beyond five years in the office will remain. It's troubling that in light of con con concurrent underfunding in our other than personal services budget, we may be forced to transfer some personal services money into our OTPS budget to pay for computers and office equipment and furnitures and supplies, all of which are much needed to support the work of our assistants. I've reviewed the proposed legislation sponsored by you, Chairman Lansman, and Bronx Councilwoman Diana Ayala, and the idea of establishing a task force to evaluate salary parity, retention, funding, infrastructure, and workloads of assistant district attorneys and public defenders may be able to help. I'm not taking a position, but perhaps that is a step to help us. But right now, from what we can see, there is no uniform, consistent method to fund the city's DA's offices. The city has no apparent guidelines for the establishment of fair and competitive starting wage salary for attorneys in the service of the city of New York. Some lawyers employed by the city are compensated for overtime, nights, and weekends. However, assistant district attorneys routinely work in excess of 35 hours and are required to work nights, weekends, and holidays, and on-call duties for up to 24 hours at a time without any additional compensation. They also carry the burden of exorbitant student loan debt in addition to cost of living, New York City housing costs, as well as transportation costs and childcare. ADAs work on average a 45-hour work week, which amounts to $18.53 an hour. That's only $3 more than a minimum wage. This is, not fair and re this is not a fair and reasonable compensation for professionals who ensure public safety, pr prosecute fairly, and meet the highest ethical standards. At the very least, a 21st century strategic plan for the city to fund DA's offices should include a reliable starting salary index which would apply not just to DA's office, but to all city agencies. A 21st century strategic plan should include a periodic review by independent compensation specialists or consultants who could assess the salary requirements of DA's offices, taking into account the prevailing and changing economic factors from year to year, as well as expanding the nature or expanding the nature of the prosecutor's job. The consultants could propose a DA pay scale with salary ranges that would keep each of the five DA's offices and the Office of Special Narcotics within a known range of salaries according to experience level. This analysis could and should extend to lawyers throughout city agencies as well as to prevent significant future disparities. While it is our understanding that the city has not articulated a specific formula to address funding over the past few years, we believe the city should consider, and I know that they are considering uh, a number of things because we have been in conversations with them, should consider an equation that takes into account some of the following variables. Each borough's percentage of the city's population, the percentage of the city's overall per capita arrests, felonies, misdemeanors, and pending investigation, percentage of the city's overall diversion, that being the alternatives to incarceration, a percentage of the city's overall crime victims services delivered. In closing, I want to reiterate my thanks for the funding my office has received. It is heartening to know that you have faith in our work. Our mantra is pursuing justice with integrity. We carry out criminal justice reform that benefits victims, witnesses, defendants, and the community at large. We serve the people of the Bronx day in and day out, never wavering. My assistant district attorneys and all assistant district attorneys deserve pay parity. Thank you for the opportunity to address you again. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. McMahon. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Lansman and Council Member Rose, my Council Member, uh, and to the staff and all gathered here today. Uh, thank you for bringing uh, needed attention to this very important issue, which is uh, pay parity and the retention rates uh, for ADAs and public defenders. Um, I just want to point out that uh, since we took office in 2016, we have fought tirelessly together with our council delegation to get fair resources uh, to the Office of District Attorney of, on Staten Island. Uh, and as Liz Glazer pointed out, there were some historic disparities amongst the different offices, and it's something that we were able to address. And this has allowed our team uh, and myself to effectively combat the many challenges facing our borough from tragic opioid, heroin, and fentanyl epidemics uh, to the scourge of gun violence and street crime and the ongoing threat of domestic violence that plagues far too many uh, families. And the mission of our office is quite simply, keep Staten Islanders safe, provide support to victims, and hold criminals accountable for their actions, all the while trying to drive down uh, over, uh, crime numbers. And during our two and a half years in office, overall crime has dropped significantly, making Staten Island the safest borough in the city and we have successfully launched a myriad of new initiatives and programs to address the crime and drug problems Staten Islanders face every day. However, we can only continue this positive trend with the proper staff and resources. And just as with my colleagues here today, we are facing an increasingly uphill challenge with the experiential level of our ADAs and our ability to offer competitive salaries in order to retain the best talent. The people of New York deserve to have prosecutors with proper training and experience and who are of the highest quality representing them in the courtroom. And this is true even more so given all the changes that are happening to the criminal justice system and all the added requirements that we have to make sure that everyone who is accused of a crime is treated fairly and according to the law and every victim is tended to as well. As you know, prosecutors are given a tremendous amount of authority with the power of prosecutorial discretion, yet we undervalue them in their pay, which has long-lasting effects on our recruitment and retention. Similar to the other boroughs, if we do not address the issue of ADA salary parity soon, we will face an even more severe staffing crisis. In my office, retention issues have caused a ripple effect on our supervisors. The average experience level of supervisors has had to drop considerably. We have just one ADA who is not a supervisor with more than six years of criminal law experience. And at the same time, just 64% of our ADAs, 40, uh, 43 out of 67, have five years or less of experience, and 15%, 10 out of 67, have less than two years experience. Again, think of the responsibility that's put upon them every day, and think about the little experience we're affording them to go and perform their duties. Mid-level recruits are almost impossible to find, people with five, six, seven years experience, and we've had positions remain vacant for a considerable period of time. This has lasting repercussions on professional development losses, Supervisors are now being promoted with less and less experience that still expected to do more work. And for example, unit chiefs, deputy bureau chiefs, and bureau chiefs in our office all carry trial caseloads and can be responsible for prosecuting multiple homicides each. We have even had to reach so far into our experiential pool that ADAs with as little as two and a half years of experience are assigned to homicide trials. We have also found it necessary to promote staff with an earlier experience level because of the loss of the upper management due to our inability to offer competitive salaries. And while our team is committed to doing whatever it takes to keep Staten Island safe, it is unfair to continue asking so much of my staff with so little to offer them in return. Like all my colleagues here, our attorneys work very hard. They confront heart-wrenching, emotionally draining, and complex circumstances and decisions every day, and we entrust to them our faith to make the right decisions. Yet public service lawyers are significantly underpaid. The big law starting salary for a lawyer in New York City who just graduated school and passed the bar is $180,000. And in comparison, the starting salary for an ADA in our office is 68,101, which was increased from 62,000 in 2016 when we came into office. 
This increase was made during the transition period after we made a thorough analysis of the staffing structure and pay parity within the office, and we needed to do something to meet our recruitment needs. Unfortunately, we have been unable to address with that reallocation, what we've been un unable to address with that reallocation is the issue of retaining ADAs. The low pay of ADAs, and as Darcel so eloquently pointed out in her office and, and the others as well, combined with the high cost of living, high cost of student loan repayments, and desire to start a family means that we have significant brain drain for ADAs after the three-year point, and even more significantly after the five-year mark. And although the Office of Management and Budget and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice took a first step in this past budget to address salary parity for ADAs with less than five years experience. Quite honestly, this step did nothing for Staten Island as we had already internally addressed salary, salary parity with that level of ADAs. In fact, out of the, one f out of the $5.4 million you heard about, uh, which is much appreciated across the city uh, for one through fivers, Staten Island received $10,000 of that money. Our problem remains with retaining ADAs with over five years of experience. In fact, it was almost as if we were punished compared to the other boroughs for proactively addressing our parity and recruitment, recruitment struggles by reallocating and training younger staff to address our imminent needs. Additionally, despite often working long hours and on our weekends, our, our ADAs are not paid any overtime. They do not receive weekend pay, and they do not receive compensation for meals, travel, or other expenses. And this is in stark contrast to other city agencies and legal organizations where employees rightfully earn overtime when they are asked to put in extra hours. And due to the unpredictable nature of criminal cases, working a normal nine to five day is, is never possible for my ADAs, as many of their duties, such as interviewing witnesses or responding to crime scenes, can fall outside of normal hours. The changing nature of law practice also means there are fewer and fewer lifetime prosecutors who bring much needed experience and expertise to the courtroom. In our office, for example, we have just three bureau chiefs with 20 or more years of experience with the office, and notably a bureau chief with as little as 11 years experience. So I cannot stress enough that the value of a veteran prosecutor, what they, he or she brings, not only to the courtroom in trying cases, but also in mentoring and guiding the younger staff to avoid mistakes and grow into better lawyers. And we see more and more in, in, pub, in, in public cases that how costly mistakes by prosecutors can be, and yet we're doing very little uh, with our resources in this city to make sure that we don't that we ha have the best prosecutors possible representing the people. Because of the challenges we face with pay parity, this means our recruitment pool has dwindled to lawyers who come from personal wealth, law school graduates who have struggled to find other employment, or talented lawyers who have aspired to be prosecutors their whole lives or careers but practically cannot remain in our employ for long. A look at some of the salaries of other city workers I think would be very helpful. Consider this, a sanitation worker, who are very near and dear to my heart, considering my former uh, position as chair of the sanitation committee here in this esteemed council, a sanitation worker, rightfully so, with five and a half years experience, makes on average $88,616 with overtime, an ADA in our office, Makes eight, with that same level of experience makes $81,000. A police officer with five and a half years experience makes $85,292, not including holiday, longevity, uniform allowance, overtime. Someone with the same years on our office, $81,000. A firefighter with five years experience making on average with overtime $110,293. In our office, the same ADA working the same amount of time with a law school background and law school debt is making $81,000. And it has been reported in the private sector that union uh, hotel housekeepers uh, will see their hourly wage, wage rate grow so that they'll be making $68,900 when they start, again, more than a starting ADA in our office. These people deserve their pay, don't get me wrong, but the people who work in our offices deserve to have a living wage commensurate with their experience, abilities, and responsibilities. We believe the public deserve the best in our prosecutors, and our prosecutors deserve our respect. 
and at the very least, the ability to make a living from this honorable and incredibly important public service sector. For those reasons and more, I'm proud to join my colleagues here today in bringing attention to this issue and requesting that the committee take seriously pay parity and retention rates in our offices. We thank you for your time and consideration, and I look forward to continuing this work with you. Um, I would like to also, not in my remarks, but just comment uh, on the proposed legislation and just say that while we all agree in the, in the goals of, of having uh, a fairer system, as someone who sat in that chair some years ago, I'm just not sure why the, the council would want to sort of delegate its duties to a task force, not its duties, but it's also its powers, to a task force of oversight and budgeting um, to, to give us the money that would allow us to pay parity. And, and also, as Liz Glazer said, keep in mind that we are duly elected uh, public officials who seek to retain some uh, independence and authority over how we do our budgeting as well, just as you do in your own individual uh, member offices budgets. But I'd be glad to talk to you about that more at length uh, going forward, and we thank you again for having us. Thank you. Mr. Ryan. Good morning. I will attempt to be brief. Uh, Mr. Kearney Brown sends his best wishes, and we thank you for the opportunity to discuss with you the issues of pay parity and retention rate for ADAs and public defenders. At the outset, we would like to express our gratitude to the Council for its continued support of our office, particularly in regard to the budget funding provided in fiscal year 19 adopted plan. Uh, these funds will uh, enable our office to hire additional staff in a variety of off areas, including opioid prescription drug trafficking, domestic violence, human trafficking, body-worn cameras, and uh, property release initiatives. While this additional staffing does not bring us up to the level of ADA staffing, staffing equivalent to that of our fellow district attorney's office, offices, it is much needed and will indeed help improve our approach to criminal justice in Queens County. In addition, in the area of ADA salary parity, the Council's ongoing efforts help secure $760,000 in funding for our office for salary increases for ADAs in classes one through five. As, re as a result, ADA salaries in these classes are now on par with their counterparts in New York City Law Department. At least I thought that was the case until I heard uh, DA Clark speak before. I, if their numbers have raised, we're behind again. The funding has made significant impact on salary levels for these ADAs, with a $5,000 to $9,000 increase received depending on class year. We appreciate your recognition of the important work of our ADAs and the need for competitive salaries to reflect that. We are optimistic that these salary increases will enable us to better retain our newer ADA staff, who often leave for higher paying jobs in the private sector and other governmental agencies due to understandable financial concerns often caused by crushing student loan debt. While we are appreciative for the funding received, it unfortunately only focused on our newest ADAs and not our entire ADA staff. As a result, our existing salary compression issues were further magnified and we needed to look at our ADA staff as a whole in order to make adjustments to the salaries of ADAs beyond the five-year mark. This was critical since over 58% of our office have been with the office five years or more. Had we not made adjustments, for example, a five-year ADA with the new raise would be earning the same salary as what a 10-year ADA was then making, and more, obviously, than a six- to nine-year ADA. We alerted Mach J and OMB of our concerns at the time when we were informed of the raises for the, for the one to five year ADAs and have since requested uh, baseline funding from OMB to offset the self-funded portion of the raise package. We once again ask for the council's support and allocation of these funds to our office. With that being said, we still face challenges ahead. While we have been fortunate in that our overall ADA attrition rate is comparatively low, we have seen our ADA attrition on an upward trend over the last several years. The bulk of this attrition continues to be with our assistant district attorneys uh, with between five and ten years of experience, the future of our office. This possesses significant challenges. Each year, the office makes active recruiting efforts to attract new law school graduates to join our office as assistant district attorneys. And when they join our staff, we provide intensive training, including classroom sessions, moot court exercises, visits to drug rehabilitation facilities and jails, continuing legal education and individual mentoring to ensure that we provide the quality of legal representation for the people to which the residents of Queens are entitled. We rely on retaining these attorneys as they grow to inexperience so they can handle more complex prosecutions 
including serious felonies and specialized matters involving a wide uh, variety of areas, including sex offenses, child abuse, domestic violence, homicides, gang violence, and sophisticated economic crimes, among many others. When these attorneys leave after we have invested significant time and effort in training them, we lose the experience and training levels needed to most effectively carry out our mission of investigating and prosecuting the over 60,000 arrest cases we handle each year in Queens County. In addition, moving forward, we must also continue to monitor ADA salary structures to ensure that salaries remain competitive. We look forward to working with the Council, OM, OMB, and MOCJ to ensure that ADA salaries are adequately funded and that future salary adjustments are implemented as needed. In closing, we have attached a summary chart of the new ADA salary levels for years one through five, as well as the ADA retention statistics you requested. We thank you again for your ongoing efforts and continued support of our office. We look forward to continuing to work with you and your staff on these and many other issues and um, uh, matters moving forward. Uh, regarding the legislation, uh, we have not taken a fixed position on it. I just note that very rarely have I seen a task force of 12 people really accomplish all that much. Uh, it may be this would be an exception, uh, but uh, we have been working closely with OMV and uh, Mock J, and quite, uh, quite frankly, at this point, we think that's probably a more fruitful way to go, uh, but we're open to studying it further. I note that the legislation also calls, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Ms. Longo is anxious to have us study the culture of legal aid, nor uh, which legislation calls for, and uh, nor am I inviting her to uh, study our culture, uh, which is part of the legislation. Uh, but uh, we're certainly willing to keep talking. Um, I'm, I do not know the salary structure of, of legal aid, uh, so I can't really talk about their salaries. Uh, you know, I, I do note uh, some differences in that their staff are unionized and have certain rights and uh, things that an, an ADA just doesn't have. So in comparing the salaries of ADAs and legal aid, while there are similarities, I think you're, you will have to study the differences, and I don't know enough about the differences to offer an opinion. And again, I thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Longo. Thank you, Chairman Lansman, for holding um, this uh, important hearing on a critical issue and also is quite unprecedented in many ways. One is that for, it's unprecedented that we are actually in a room in City Hall talking about it. Also equally unprecedented is I think this might be the first time the public defenders and the DAs have ever sat at the same table to testify. Um, as you know, I am Tina Longo, and I am uh, proud to say that I've served this city and the people of this city as a public defender since 2002. The testimony I provide today is not only on behalf of the staff that I lead, many of them are here, but most of them are in court with their clients, but also on behalf of Adrian Holder, the attorney in charge of our civil practice and her staff, Dawn Mitchell, attorney in charge of the juvenile rights practice and her staff, and on behalf of the heads of each of the city's defense organizations, Bronx Defender, Brooklyn Defender Services, Neighborhood Defender Services of Harlem, New York County Defender Services, and Queens Law Associate, and all of their staff. Together, our organizations employ close to 4,000 people who represent over 300,000 New Yorkers in criminal, civil, family, immigration, direct, legal matters annually, and affect the lives of millions of New Yorkers by the work that we do every day to reform policies through legislative and administrative advocacy and systemic litigation. In fact, when Mock J testified about the drop in policing and the drop in prosecution and the reduction of people being caged at Rikers Island, the fact of the matter is that that work is done by public defenders in this city long before reform was discussed. Years and decades of systemic litigation that got us to the point to recognize publicly that what we have been doing to black and brown communities in this city has got to end. So let me take a minute to speak proudly about the people who dedicate their lives to public defense. Every single day, seven days a week, nearly 24 hours a day, the staff of all of our offices and that staff are not only attorneys, they're paralegals, investigators, social workers, managers, fight for racial equity and social justice. To them being a public defender, to us being public defenders, is a calling, not a job. 
Everyone is driven to work long hours under very stressful situations and circumstances on behalf of our clients, not because we want to count the wins in a hearing or trial, but simply because we love what we do and we love who we do it for. In fact, the staff of our offices are the lawyers for the people of the city of New York. And you have said it and we have said it, and I agree to the extent with the district attorneys that we are seeing unprecedented rates of attrition, particularly attorneys of color that have joined our offices in the last years who come from the exact communities in which we serve. By a person's fifth or sixth year as a public defender, often I have heard, we have heard, that there is a second job being worked at nights and weekends, either in the food industry or driving a lift to help ends meet. That is the same for our social workers and our paralegals and investigators, and you'll hear from some of them on the next panel. By year 10, the dream of being a New York City public defender for the rest of your life has ended. And it is time, unfortunately, that people have to move on. And where do they go? They go to Corp Council. They go to the uh, Human Rights Commission, and they go to OCA's court attorney program. And simply put, they're doing this because the cost of living in New York City is way too high, as said by everybody this morning. We did a retention study that looked at a 10-year period of classes that we brought on every year in the fall from 2007 to 2017. And sadly, but not surprising, because we know, because I get, the, uh, we all get, and I get resignations almost monthly, sometimes weekly, that as the experience of staff increases, the rate of retention decreases, with the largest percentage of staff leaving between five and 10 years. By the 10th year of hire at Legal Aid Society, essentially half of the class that we hired in that year, nearly 48%, have left us. In ex exit interviews, I hear the same tale over and over again. I love what I do. I love who I do it for. I would do it for the rest of my life, but I can't do it anymore. And here's what's driving that. In a recent report on New York City median rent prices, a cost of a one-bedroom apartment is $28.50 and the cost of a two-bedroom apartment is $3,280 a month. In a recent report done uh, of 181 law schools in the United States, the average student indebtedness ranged from 53, oh, a little over $53,000 to close to $200,000. And while, yes, there has been a public law forgiveness program from the federal government, one might imagine under President Trump, a recent article said that 98% of applicants are getting denied. And then if you want to start a family as a public defender or anybody who is doing public interest work in this city, daycare is nearly $36,000 a year. And here's what the reality of the situation is. The city of New York and the Office of Court Administration actually know this. Why? Because at the 10th year mark, Corp Council pays their attorneys $108,000. So that's a recognition that it's really expensive to live in this city. That is $18,000 more than I am able to pay for an attorney at the same level. Office of Court Administration, our state funder for case cap, pays a court attorney that only needs three years of experience, $98,000, with a $4,100 uh, relocation budget. In comparison, the salary of a three-year legal aid attorney is $34,000 less. At five years, it's $28,000 less. And someone who has 10 years of experience being a public defender representing the people of this city makes $8,619 less than that court attorney. Our inability to pay salaries competitive with New York City and OCA 
has all to do with the way in which we are funded. For those of us charged with leading our offices and negotiating our budgets with MOCJ or OCA, we have a daunting task every year to try to make the, uh, to try to pay increases to our sta staff through salaries when our budgets are either held flat or in this year's case, cut by the state for me. There are simply things that we have to pay for as independent nonprofits that I actually will say my colleagues may not have to pay. Rent, with the exception of Kings County, health benefits, pension costs. Those things are in our budgets, and we have to negotiate that. So now I actually want to turn right to actually some of the testimony about uh, the budgeting process, because I believe there was some an undercurrent uh, that I want to sort of lay out, that I've laid out and actually the other chief defenders have laid out when we testified uh, in May about our budgets, and to which we have been talking to uh, Mock Jay, particularly this administration's team, since they, all, they began and took office. So we've had the conversation about parity. We, uh, we responded to the call for the RFP by budgeting at least what we could to bring us in line at that time with the parity structure of a combined average DA salary. We budgeted that way. We told them that was a core value. We gave them budgets because they asked for budgets in this RFP that actually looked at the totality of what our offices needed, including increase in salaries, to actually effectively represent our clients. And what we heard and what we have had to face is that there is still the belief in this city that when you see a quote, quote, reduction in uh, intake, and it was talked about here at the table earlier with the Mock J panel, that as cases go down, there is still a belief that work goes down. And I'm going to tell you that the public defenders of all of our offices and all of our staff know that that is actually quite untrue. That actually, we have to do more to ensure that the people who are still being prosecuted and still being arrested and are being prosecuted and arrested on serious charges, that they have effective representation and that those attorneys need the experience at the exact level they are leaving us. And we have said this, not once, not twice, but a hundred times to Mock J and OCA. This year they kept our budgets basically flat. They in fact didn't even start the RFP and have not started the RFP until January 1 and kept our first six months flat. The so-called colas that we get, they skipped 2017 for us, even though we told them that that would set back our salaries yet again to 2015 levels. So this idea that they are uh, giving us funding for new programming, true. I appreciate the money that they have given for us to do decarceration because that is critical to getting people out of Rikers right now. But that has nothing to do with the base salary. Let's be clear, nothing to do with the base salary that is breaking our public defenders every single day. That increase is significant. I'm not going to tell you differently because the salaries of Corp Council are significantly more. This system was created. This problem of needing to pay us much more money to get it right is systemic because it hasn't been addressed for decades, and it's time. And while we have spent a lot of time talking about attorneys, you are going to hear from some of our non-attorney staff. And if you think the problems are tough for public defenders who are attorneys, so is it for our social workers, paralegals, support teams, investigators, 
the rate of turnover for those positions is incredible. And in true, I cannot find people to come to work to fill those positions because we're not paying enough as a starting salary. And there are school loans there too that often get ignored in this conversation. And so you'll hear about that. So what's the solution? I appreciate a task force. Getting people around, uh, thought leaders around a table, really important. But we really actually don't need it. I, 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 and I, but I appreciate it, but we don't need it. We have a salary scale for Corp Council. We have one. Take that salary set, figure out what this in fact will cost, and fund it. But there is something that actually we do want to propose, which is for the city council to consider actually starting its own loan forgiveness program for the people who serve New York City residents in all of the ways we do. And the other thing is for us to really consider what could we do about child care for public interest sector families? Could we, in fact, give a subsidy for people? Uh, the federal government does it, uh, and there's a child care center in the, in the var uh, right here for federal employees, including federal defenders. So I leave you with those. But as to the task force, we're losing people now. By the time I get back to my office, I'm afraid I'm going to see another resignation. So I think it's critical for us to move quicker, and I thank you for our time. Thank you very much. Ms. Cumberbatch? Good morning, or rather afternoon. My name is Shannon Cumberbatch, and I am the Director of Hiring, Diversity, and Community Engagement at the Bronx Defenders. Thank you so much for hearing me and for having me today. An integral part of my role is the recruiting and retention, the hiring and maintenance of zealous attorneys and advocates who are committed to representing our clients in criminal, civil, immigration, family court proceedings. And so, in that vein, I do want to begin by addressing, or rather answering, a question that was posed very early on in these hearings, which was whether or not the pay issue is an impediment to recruiting and retaining competitive and strong candidates in public defense. And the answer, in my experience, is unequivocally yes. In every aspect of my role, from mentoring and fostering interest in public defense careers for students early on to um, extending offers to and interviewing already interested applicants to saying goodbye to my colleagues who no longer found this career to be sustainable for them. I am hearing the same concern or the same question posed over and over, which is essentially, while I am incredibly committed to supporting our clients and their community, how am I supposed to support myself while doing so on this salary, right? And, you know, another equally important and related part of my role as the Director of Hiring, Diversity, and Community Engagement is promoting diversity and inclusion in a conscious workplace that centers the needs and experiences of the communities that we serve. And what I have found in that role is that the pay disparity in public defense, the lack of financial stability offered by this career path, disproportionately affects aspiring defenders from the communities that we serve. It disproportionately affects those from immigrant backgrounds, those from racially and socioeconomically marginalized backgrounds, those whose lives have been directly impacted by the systems in which we advocate. Individuals from these demographics are overwhelmingly overrepresented in the court system as defendants and incredibly underrepresented in the court system as defenders. This is not mere coincidence and this is not due to lack of interest. 
and the surveys I've conducted and the research that I've done and the conversations that I've had and the discussion groups that I've hosted and the mentorship relationships that I have fostered and my communications with other defenders across the nation and colleagues from the community that we serve. Pay and the lack of financial stability has been a consistent and pressing issue and has for many made public defense seem as if it is an inaccessible and unsustainable career for many of our most competitive and passionate candidates, especially those who share identities and experiences with the communities that we serve. Candidates from populations disproportionately affected by poverty, structural inequality, and system involvement are least likely to benefit from generational wealth, least likely to have familial support to supplement their low salaries, least likely to have access to resources that can subsidize their exorbitant expenses, particularly in New York City. In fact, those from these marginalized communities are more likely to be primarily responsible for supporting their loved ones whose, whose lives are stifled by entanglement in the systems that our clients navigate. Coming out of this financial hardship with even greater financial responsibility after school, mountains of student debt, having absolutely no safety net, and then unsustainable pay maintains this cycle of struggle for many applicants, not only making it such that they cannot use their education and privilege to get their families out of poverty, but ensuring that they remain not too far removed from it themselves, even as lawyers and advocates. This is something that students think about very early on when they are coming out of their own communities and thinking about ways to give back. One student, when expressing her passion for public defense and yet her anxiety around the financial limitations of the career, shared, I am considering a career in public defense because I feel like it is my responsibility and passion to contribute to communities like my own. I grew up in a poor neighborhood in the Bronx. My parents are both Mexican immigrants. During my time in school, I had difficulties not being able to work as many hours throughout every week to send money back home. Since high school, I have been financially responsible for myself, and it has been an extra worry for me to make sure that my family is not having too much financial instability. I know that it is easy for many people from low-income families to go into jobs that are a lot more financially secure because their first priority is being able to provide for their families. Personally, I want to continue working in public defense, but I also know that I am not in a financial position where my parents can take care of any expenses or even help me out. This student's circumstances and early anxiety about pursuing a career in public defense is neither unreasonable nor uncommon, but instead very accurately reflects the very daunting reality for so many of our applicants and staff members from similar backgrounds. Many believe that choosing a career in public defense simply means to sacrifice the luxuries afforded by lucrative positions in private law. And while part of that may be true, for many, and especially for those from the communities that we serve, it means struggling to attain and maintain basic necessities. It means after much debt and formal education, potentially facing housing insecurity, not being able to cover medical expenses, not being able to use your privilege and education to provide financial stability for your own family in the community that you are so committed to serving. This takes an incredible mental, emotional, and physical toll on those who do decide to make the sacrifice. Making that sacrifice not only means carrying that constant worry about one's financial stability, but in order to make it work practically, it often means maintaining multiple jobs. I can personally attest that for our staff, it means after spending all day in court on Friday, sometimes being in night arraignments on Friday, waking up at seven o'clock in the morning on Saturday to go to the additional job, to be able to cover basic necessities, to be able to sustain yourself, not even being able to build families and build wealth, just being able to stay afloat individually. One of our 
newer staff members who was once a summer intern as well, shared, I chose to attend law school because I always wanted to be a public defender. I would watch my father get relentlessly pulled over by the police. I would shake in fear every time the blue and red lights flashed behind us. I thought that police were an inescapable, unshakable fact of a person of color's existence. And despite having limited ability to speak English, my father would fearlessly stand up for himself. He is the type of advocate I would like to be. Growing up as a, Lat a Latina and the daughter of two immigrants, I have learned that communities of color are incredibly resilient. And with my unique experience, I hope to apply my background to foster a trusting relationship between myself and clients of the Bronx community. Just two days ago, this newer staff attorney who is about one month into the job shared that while she is incredibly excited and proud to be doing this work that she considers priceless, she already just one month into the job is saddled with the crushing anxiety of wondering how she is going to make ends meet, how she is going to start making her student loans, how she's going to make this career path that she loves and values so much and worked so hard for since she left her community, how she's going to make it work, how she's going to remain in this work. The negative and disparate impact of pay disparity and pu that public defense has on recruiting and retention of applicants from racially and socioeconomically diverse backgrounds is not just an issue of parity. And it's not just a matter of being paid for the work that you are doing. It becomes an issue of survival for our defenders. And having such diversity in the workplace is a matter of providing quality, culturally competent, client-centered representation and public defense. We need people on staff who can relate to, interpret, and empathize with our clients' experiences in their cultures and their communities. People who can speak the many languages and dialects represented in this incredibly diverse city. People who know what it's like to be in desperate need of legal assistance when facing the loss of liberty or family separation. These perspectives and experiences are critical to the culture at a public defender office but are often lost when people have to decide between supporting their community and being able to support themselves and their families. I thank you for your time today. I appreciate your attention to this issue, and I look forward to working together to make public defense a more sustainable career and to also bridge the gap between those who are in need of defending and those who have the privilege, those who can actually afford to be a defender. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was a very powerful testimony and um, very enlightening, the extent to which it's difficult to create a public defender office that looks like the people who are run through the criminal justice system in this city. And you know, it's been a core value of this council to um, recognize and reckon with the overwhelming burden that the criminal justice system places on uh, black and brown people and the need for representation in all of our public institutions, particularly in the criminal justice system, uh, that looks like the people who are affected or served um, in that system. And, and your testimony is, is one um, the issues that you raise in your testimony is something that we knew, but the depth that you uh, brought to it and, and the examples that you gave um, are really very powerful, and I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, let me ask uh, Tina, uh, what conversations did you have that you could share with Mock J about the issue of pay parity and, and the RFP. Sure. Because I remember last year, two years ago, we had Mock J at a hearing. I don't remember if it was a budget hearing. It might have been a hearing that was dedicated to the, to the contract itself, um, urging the city to uh, uh, produce an RFP that reflected the holistic approach to criminal defense 
um, and also address the issue of, of pay parity. I know that you, the, the, the bids that you, are, you and the other pu public defenders submitted reflected those, those uh, goals. And I know in the council's response to the mayor's preliminary budget, we tried to advocate for bridging the gap between what the administration had laid out uh, in its budget and what it would take to get from there to, to the kind of uh, public defender contracts that we all think are what are necessary and, and what people deserve. So what happened? Good question. Um, so it goes back to probably, uh, so way before the RFP uh, for this contract cycle actually began, uh, we asked for, uh, all the defender uh, agency or organizations asked for a meeting with MockJ because we had heard that they were starting to think through the next RFP and what we wanted to do was sort of give our perspective. It was pretty new uh, in the administration change. And we laid out all of the issues that we believed, including pay parity, and most importantly, stressed that this notion that you fund our offices by the number of people we arraign was not the way to think about things. First of all, it was enormously uh, problematic that we should uh, be actually paying public defenders for how many people are policed and prosecuted in this city, right? Um, at the, the drive then, a, if you might, might imagine, to a, a system that uh, relied on that was uh, inherently unjust. They agreed to that. They agreed that we needed to actually look at parity and how, how much we pay people because what we wanted to do was to invest in the lives of people who were going to stay with us because we already started to see the shift in the number of people being prosecuted on misdemeanor and violations being reduced, again, as a result of decades of our litigation um, and advocacy from all of our offices. We saw that coming five years ago, started talking about it at that point, and said, we're going to have a problem. And even now, as I'm negotiating contracts, those are the same things, and we're all negotiating our contracts, and yeah, fairly, I guess we can't talk about dollar amounts, but we could talk about the general concepts. We have been saying the same thing, and we have not gotten any more money. And I want to raise this that I did not say earlier, but this gives me the op This notion that there is a state pool of money that somehow is going to miraculously put us in line somehow closer to the DAs is actually wrong. The money coming from the Office of Indigent Legal Services as part of the justice initiative or justice law that was signed by Governor Cuomo is specifically to continue to reduce caseloads to a different level than currently. And in fact, cannot be used not one single dollar of it could be used to supplant the county's responsibility because I want to remind uh, uh, all of us that Gideon in New York State is applied to the counties, not the state. It will still always remain New York City's collective responsibility as five different counties to fund public defense. They know that. Mock J knows that. The Office of Indigent Legal Services and Mock J are meeting. I have raised, we have all raised, that none of the money we are getting to, to reduce caseloads further between now and 2023, we have to get to a new standard. Not one single dollar of it can go to salary uh, increases. It has to go to increasing our staff to bring the caseloads down. Mock J, in fact, though, continued to budget us based on the current caseload. And in their position, based on that current caseload, which I'll remind everybody is 400 misdemeanors or about 150 felonies with a felony rated at 2.66, 
Their position is, well, defenders, you are below your state cap. Our position is, however, we've got to get to 300 misdemeanors by 2023, which means I cannot attrit, I have to grow. We all do. So that money from the state is used for that. So the, the conversation is happening, Chairman. They're not listening. And what we hear in response is, well, we're going to take your ass to OMB. You should know, and I'm, I, I'm in, sort of, it was interesting to hear Mock Jay say that, that there is a deep sort of conversations, and I'm assuming not a deal, but conversations happening with the district attorneys to bring them into corp counsel parity by 2025. Good to know. First of all, I think, again, we could do it a lot sooner for everybody, so let's, let's dispense with that. Uh, do it next year, but you should know that our two-year contracts uh, keep us flat even going into fiscal year 20. And every year, our costs go up. Again, we pay for rent, we pay for health care, we pay for pension, we pay for investigators, we pay for experts, things that our colleagues don't need to pay for because potentially they are part of NYPD or, or, the, or other city agencies. And so there is that crunch. So let's turn to the, to the DAs. And I want to um, just repeat some of the facts that uh, Judge Clark uh, listed in her testimony, which are, which are pretty shocking. Um, since you appeared before us asking for pay parity, which I assume is a reference to the budget hearing, 50 ADAs have left your office. Over the past year, 105 ADAs have left the office. About a third, a little less than a third, went to city, state, and federal agencies. That's who your competition is. Yes. The attrition rate in your office is 20%. The average experience level of an ADA is three years and eight months. Interestingly, just the lost productivity and dupe, I'm quoting you, the lost productivity and duple of reassignment of cases cost an estimated $3.7 million this year. That should alarm and scare the hell out of everybody. I agree. Because there's something to be said for experience and the um, uh, judgment that comes with, with, with tenure. I asked um, Ms. Longo what conversations there have been with the administration regarding the, the bid and the RFP. Ms. Glazer had referenced conversations with the DAs. And I've heard from your offices bits and pieces over the last year or two that information was sent to Mock J and you wondered what, what happened to it, what, what was used. I remember the conversation, Mr. Ryan, in, in your office. Um, so what is Ms. Glazer talking about when she talks about the conversations going back and forth, some reference to conversations since the summer? Is there some, um, some effort that, that we're not aware of to try to come up with some kind of systematic uh, long-term solution to this, to this recurring problem? Because I think, not to mischaracterize her testimony, that's what she was hinting at. Well, we, we have been in conversations with them, and when Mark J asks us for any statistics or information, we've provided it. And, you know, it's, I guess they're working on it to get back to us as to how we get to this parity that we absolutely need. Don't get me wrong, the, the, the money that we did receive to bring the assistance up years one through five is fine, but it caused compression, which meant more people left. Those middle, um, between five and 10 year assistants left. They saw us give money to years one through five and they say, hey, wait a minute. I've been hanging around here hearing that we're gonna get more money. You give the money to one through five, I'm out of here and that's what happened. They're still going. I mean, it's between the workload because there's a lot more work that prosecutors have to do. Even though they say arrests are down and crime is down, there's a lot more involved in dealing with prosecution of cases. There's more alternatives to incarceration. We're, we're doing more with, uh, you know, making sure we um, 
live up to our ethical standards. There's more investigations. There's a lot more that's being required, especially when you're trying to be a progressive office and do some of the um, things that are going to, you know, help people who are accused of crime also bring fairness to the system, which is something that I have dedicated my office to making sure that I do. So with all of those increasing things that wasn't part of prosecution 10 and 20 years ago, there's more that has to be done. And with the cost of living, some, a lot of, some of the people moved out of state. They couldn't even stay here to even go to another city or state agency. They had to leave New York State or New York City because it is just simply too expensive. So in as much as Mark J needs information from us, I make sure I tell my financial team, give it to them so that we can get to a point that now we can move to this next step and deal with those attorneys who are five years or more because that's, that's where the drain brain, uh, brain drain has been is that five to 10 year. I need those assistants and they're leaving. And, and Staten Island, Queens, do you have any sense that in your conversations with Mark, with, with Mark Jay that they're moving towards some kind of solution or, or plan here? They've, they've asked us for a lot of data and a lot of analysis, and uh, we've coupled that with our request to them. Uh, so I hope we're not naive, but we believe the fact that we're giving them this data and the analysis uh, is part of the conversation to get us to where we want to get to. I just want to underscore that. I just want to sort of, as to Staten Island, you know, in, in, since we came into office in 2016, we've lost 26 ADAs, really, through attrition. And we start, when I came in uh, to office, there were uh, 44, I believe. Now we're up to 60 or so. But that's almost a 50% attrition rate over two and a half years. That's how bad it is. Um, and just in the last year, we lost three top supervisors to uh, state court positions. Uh, so again, that, the, the problem is real. And then as to our conversations with Mark J, uh, we continue in the hope that they've been fruitful. Uh, but I don't want to underscore that we've been all been very transparent, all the information that's been requested. We have provided it over, you know, over and uh, over again. Um, and so those discussions are there. And I think that that could be the mechanism to achieve the goal that's, that's sought in the legislation is by working with them and working with this committee we should be able to get to a point where we all agree that uh, we need to have uh, better pay for uh, committed lifelong prosecutors, and I will say as public defend to public defenders as well, and how that's 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 figured out. Um, but that has to be done, and we we think we are moving to we are hopeful that we are moving towards that. We thought that the years one through five was sort of a down payment, but we're very optimistic that it has not be uh, going to end there. Um, and there's a realization that we appreciate this committee's continued advocacy uh, in that regard. And, and I also want to say that I know that they understand what we're asking for and the goal that we're trying to set because they did give the uh, initial amount for years one through five. And I know the fact that they understand the value of it because I was very fortunate when I came in that I did receive a substantial amount of money to bring the Bronx DA's office up to 21st century level. So I know the commitment of the city. So don't, I don't want anyone to think that I don't appreciate that. But I think that we need to continue to progress, to move in a direction that is going to be positive for the people of the Bronx and for the people of this city, quite frankly, between all the DA's offices and the public defenders. We're all doing the same work. And I, I, I also, I, I do want to say one more thing. I know the hour is getting late here, but uh, as everyone has said, to, to do sort of case count is really not the right metric, uh, if you will. Uh, think about the whole program that we run for early diversion. Uh, hundreds of people, close to 500 people in the last year and a half have avoided the criminal justice system. But in order to do that, I need ADAs, but also I need, I have two social workers who are now in the office running that program. So in little old Staten Island, close to 500 people have found meaningful engagement to deal with their addiction crisis and avoided the criminal justice system. You can't measure that by case count. Ultimately, <clears throat> we get the criminal justice system that we pay for. Right? And if we want 
our prosecutors to be experienced and professional and to use their judgment and to, to participate in all these diversion and other reforms. And we want our public defenders to give people the zealous and professional representation that they're entitled to and to also contribute and, and be part of all the reform efforts that we want. People need to be paid fairly. Uh, the proof will be in the, in the pudding uh, very shortly. The mayor's preliminary budget comes out, I think it's in February. Um, your RFP is supposed, your, your new contract was supposed to start in January, so presumably that's going to come to a, a conclusion soon. Um, and I just want to thank you all. There are other people who are going to testify, of course. But I do want to thank the, the leadership of the, the public defenders organizations and the district attorneys to testify together for this joint effort to get our frontline prosecutors and public defenders the salaries that they deserve. Thank you very much. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, we have this room for another 45 minutes. We have seven witnesses who want to testify, which should be, as long as we're disciplined, we should make it. So I want to call up, uh, forgive me if I get uh, any of the names wrong, Danielle Regis, um, Lily Getz, Elizabeth Bender, Deborah Wright, Adriana, Matias, Mat Matias, Matias, uh, Adriana Bellamy, and Aiken Akinjola. I apologize if I messed up any of those names. We will sort them out. Everyone has a seat? Good. All right, if you'd all raise your right hand so we can swear you in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Um, we're going to put four minutes on the clock. If someone feels that they need more time, we'll, we'll work with you. But let's use that as a baseline uh, so we can give everybody an opportunity to be heard. Um, I think the first person that we're going to ask to testify is uh, Danielle Regis. And... Um, Please just uh, state your name and, and your affiliation and, and test, testify. You gotta have the red light. There we go. 
There you go. And just a little closer. Thank you. My name is Danielle Regis, and I am a senior staff attorney at Brooklyn Defender Services. I've been defending clients in Brooklyn criminal and Supreme Courts for over seven and a half years. In September and October of 2018, Brooklyn Defender Services conducted interviews and a focus group with public defenders willing to state their personal stories with this council. This is what we learned. Our defenders are plagued with growing student loan debt. Most express struggling to save as a top concern. A common topic of concern was starting a family. One person shared, no one becomes a public defender for the money, but at a certain point, the low pay and student loan debt that the vast majority of lawyers face become untenable when faced with financial challenges of raising a child in New York City. Financial challenges also present a variety of ways for our defenders. One defender disclosed, my spouse and I live in a rent-stabilized apartment, and we still struggle to make ends meet with no hope of saving for the future. All of the defenders reflected on the seemingly inevitable existential question, which one defender characterized best by saying whether being a public defender is incompatible with the goals of financial stability and starting a family. All of the defenders express a profound sadness at having to confront this question. My story is one uh, that resonates with a lot of my colleagues. I'm a Brooklynite. As a law student at Brooklyn Law School, I was able to live on my own while incurring significant student loan debt. But once I actually became a defender, I had to move back to my parents' home. They continue to subsidize my living up to today. In spite of the fact that I am now married. I grew up in this borough. It's the borough that I love. My parents were able to put me in Catholic school when I was a child. It's something that I believe, well, that I know that I won't be able to afford to do for my own children when I start a family. Half of my salary every year goes to paying my student loan debt. And my student loan debt seems to have only increased in the past seven and a half years. Loan repayment assistance programs are nice, but they don't do enough. Oftentimes, they only pay a fraction of what we actually owe each year. We list a number of stories in our written testimony. I'll share two with you now. Story number six. I'm, I'm the one that's supposed to be helping my aging parents, not the other way around. I have to be honest and truthful and disclose my parents still buy my flights to go home to see them for the holidays. Recently, my laptop got damaged and needed replacement. When I couldn't afford to pay for it, my father helped me with the, with the cost to purchase a new one. I am so grateful that my parents are able to help me, but it's a source of stress for me that they do so. My parents are retired now, and I know they use up their savings when they help me financially. I worry about how one day my parents are going to depend on me, their only child. I really don't know how I am ever going to get out of this cycle of debt to be able to really assist and support them. I tried to rent my couch on Airbnb as a way to get extra income so that I'm in a better financial situation. That didn't last very long because my landlord didn't agree and I was almost evicted. I've opted I've opted not to marry because of legal consequences of my student loan debt. That would be disastrous for my partner. Many of the attorneys can't afford self-care that they need, including but not limited to mental health treatment that is helpful when working in a field where we see on a daily basis the harsh realities of the criminal justice system causing vicarious trauma. I'm a mental health attorney at BDS, and I experience a day on a daily basis what clients who have very, very little to go, very, very little, go through trying to navigate the criminal justice system as well as their daily lives while dealing with their mental health issues. It's, a, it's incredibly traumatizing. Defenders in New York City can't wait five years or two years or even one to see an increase in pay. 
As you said yourself, Councilman Lanson, we know the problem and the solution. With all due respect, we don't need a task force. We need pay parity with city agencies now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know how else uh, we'd like to divide up. We can just go from left to right, or if, or if you've worked out something amongst yourselves and different unions and organizations, I'll defer to you. Good afternoon. I want to thank you for holding this hearing. Today is a long time coming in a struggle that we have been stuck in for decades. Our public interest attorneys and support staff have never been treated equally or with the respect that we deserve, like our counterparts at Corp Council are given every day. My name is Deborah Wright, and I am president of the Association of Legal Aid Attorneys, UAW Local 2325. In New York City alone, we represent over 1,100 members, both attorneys and support staff at various organizations, such as Legal Aid Society, Federal Defenders of New York, Youth Represent, Campbell Legal Services. We also represent Nassau County Legal Aid and Orange County Legal Aid. Our members did not make an easy choice when they chose to represent the most marginalized in our society, whether it be in criminal, housing, immigration, or juvenile court. But I strongly believe that the thread that runs through the character of all of our members is their true dedication to social justice and their clients, which is why they have chosen this calling in this profession. Just like the district attorneys and the Corporation Council, our members have chosen a path of public service. But because our members represent the indigent instead of the powerful, they have not been treated equally in terms of salary or benefits among their colleagues that they stand opposite from in court every day. It should come as no surprise that our membership carries an overwhelming load of educational debt, with the majority of members holding above $175,000 in student loans, many of whom hold even more than that. Of these, the vast majority receive no financial assistance from their law school in paying back these loans and rely solely on the small amount of assistance from the state and their own salaries to manage their debt. This, combined with the astronomical cost of living in New York City, has led to vast attrition among the attorneys in our membership, especially those within four to 10 years of experience, who are leaving the Legal Aid Society in droves to seek other employment. In those that leave Legal Aid, we have seen that it is not their commitment to public service that has changed, as they often seek jobs in the public sector serving those communities or have moved to other localities in search of lower rent but continuing as public defenders and indigent legal service attorneys. Instead, it is clear that it is economic hardship and the realities of raising a family in one of the most expensive cities in the United States that is responsible for this turnover. Our people want to continue serving their clients, but the reality is that they cannot do that at a legal aid salary. The continued attrition at legal aid and other providers has led to a gap in critically trained attorneys who are able to perform the increasingly specialized fields of law into which the city has rightfully been expanding, which are desperately needed by our clients. By allowing the attrition of experienced attorneys to continue, we will not only be doing a disservice to those attorneys, but more importantly, we will be doing a disservice to the clients to whom we will be unable to provide with quality, dynamic, and important services. There is a direct correlation between the working conditions of our members and the ability of our clients to access justice in this city, which we hold to be the shared goal not only of our union, the providers, but also the administration and the city council. For years, the assistant district attorneys have outpaced us in terms of salary and benefits to the point that we have never even gotten close to their level of compensation. Now, the assistant district attorneys and indigent legal service attorneys and staff should achieve parity with Corporation Council, who under the city's expanded programs, especially in the civil practice, have had more and more interaction with our members as opposing counsel in the face of increased civil legal services. I'm almost done. We have seen that at 10 years of experience, the average assistant corp counsel will earn $20,000 more than their legal aid counterpart and this is only counting the base salary, does not include bonuses or the generous defined benefit pension which our members unfortunately do not receive as they are not public employees. 
I would also like to specifically highlight the disparity in justice faced for our paralegal case handlers and other support staff at multiple providers who zealously stand up and represent their clients against a law department attorney in NYCHA hearings who may be earning upwards of $80,000 more than they do. The answer today is clear. To retain qualified attorneys and support staff dedicated to the representation of indigent clients, ensure just working conditions for those workers, and preserve and improve our clients' access to justice, New York City must finally fund all legal services contracts, both criminal, civil, and otherwise, to ensure, to ensure parity with the law department. We can fix this now by aligning our salaries with theirs. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to go next? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paloma Martinez. I am a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society in Queens County. I have been a staff attorney for the last little bit more than eight years. Um, I don't have anything prepared, so I, I do apologize for that. Um, but I will just speak from my personal experience, which has been that, you, you know, to be one of the, the, the least paid players in the system um, is very demoralizing sometimes, particularly when the reason why I came to legal aid, the reason why I am a public defender is um, is, 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 is to fight the police state that we live in. That's why I do it. It's not for the money. I, it's, it's, it's not for the money. I understand that. But it, that doesn't mean that we should not be paid fairly. Now, at eight years in, I just started making $85,000 a year. That's a disgrace. I have two children, a five-year-old and a 21-month-old baby. I bought a house last year. I can hardly pay my mortgage without having, I have two roommates. I'm 35 years old and I live with two roommates, my husband and my two children. I should have a third roommate to be more financially stable. If an emergency happens, I have no safety net. Just this month, the furnace at my house, in my house was broken. We were cold for a couple of days before I was able to fix it. I have $80 in my account until the end of this month when I get paid. I have student loans just like everybody else. And my, many people that we work with, yes, they have, they have family, they have um, people that they can rely on. My parents, I'm a child of immigrants. My father lives in a federally subsidized apartment in Flushing. He lives off of his social security check. My mother lives in Florida. She's on the verge of homelessness. I cannot help them. They cannot help me. So if I have another type of emergency, such my car breaks down, something else goes wrong, I practically would be on the verge of foreclosure on my home. In order to be able to buy my home, I had to take money out of my retirement fund and my little savings that I've been able to save over the last eight years with having roommates. It's a disgrace. I had a conversation the other day with a, a female corrections officer and we were joking and she was like, oh, you know, it was late in the day and I was talking to a client in corrections and she was like, well, you know, it's late, but at least you get overtime, right? And I was like, no, we, we don't get overtime. And she's like, what? You don't get overtime? No, we don't get overtime. And jokingly, I was like, you probably make more money than me with overtime. And she's like, well, how much do you make? And I told her, and she's like, I make more money than you without overtime. I have $100,000 in debt. That's, that's actually not that much. I went to public institution, in-state tu in tuition for undergrad. I went to a public university for law school as well, in-state as well. That's not that much 
there's other people that are public defenders that have more debt than that. Just being able to live in New York City on this amount of money is unrealistic. It's unsustainable. And like I said, it's a disgrace. We shouldn't have to choose between fighting for what we believe in or being able to pay your bills. Mm -hmm. Weekly, weekly, I have private attorneys come up to me and, 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 and um, I have job offers all the time, job offers. They want someone with my background, with my language skills, they want people in their office like that. I'll pay you this amount. I'm not interested. I don't want to do private work. I had a private attorney who comes to me with questions because he is not that experienced. Even asking me for motions and things like that, I'm like, I'm sorry, I cannot, I cannot send you work product. But he said to me, you know, if you wanted to, with the experience and, and, and everything that you have, you could be making a quarter million dollars a year if you wanted to, because that's what he makes. And he comes to me for advice. And I'm just not interested in that. I'm not interested in making big bucks, but I am interested in being able to survive. Mm -hmm. Are we asking for that much? Really? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Lily Getz, and I'm a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society Brooklyn Criminal Defense Practice. There is no justification for legal aid attorneys getting paid less than the lawyers we oppose in criminal and family courts every day. Eight years ago, when I started working as a public defender at Legal Aid in the Bronx, I was a family of one sharing the cost of rent with two roommates. Unlike most of my contemporaries who law, whose law school debt measures in the hundreds of thousands, I was fortunate to attend CUNY Law School on a fellowship. In addition, because I'd already been a lawyer for a few years, I got to skip the shamefully low bottom three steps of our payroll. I could save money for retirement or just for the nebulous future. Now I'm married and my husband and I have a child. I'm the sole breadwinner for my family. We live modestly. I bring my lunch from home. My daughter wears mostly hand-me-downs, and we live in a one-bedroom apartment. I love my job, but the rising costs of life make it harder and harder for all of us to live in New York City on my legal aid salary. The savings I'd accumulated as a single person upon which my family relies to supplement my income are quickly disappearing. I am decades from retirement, but I no longer earn enough to set aside much at all. Writing this made me reflect on just how problematic my decreased ability to save will be for my family for years to come. My story is not special or even an outlier. Several of my most talented colleagues have recently left legal aid for better paying jobs. They were single parents who could not afford to raise their children on our salaries, or recent law school graduates who couldn't afford to pay their rent and their student loans and still eat. Clearly, none of us chose public service for the money, but we should be able to afford to have a second child if we want to, to save up and buy a home, to pay our rent and our student loans and still have money left for food, to retire while we are still healthy enough to enjoy it. I spoke with two of my supervisors about how we'd be testifying in this hearing today. One of them asked me to specifically ask you for a raise um, for himself, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> They mentioned, though, that their counterparts in the district attorney's office, lawyers who began their careers at the same time, are currently making $40,000 more than they do. We struggle to provide for ourselves and our families the very same basic human needs, food, shelter, clothing, education, child care, elder care, that we fight every day for our clients. This is shameful. We could have decided to work anywhere. And we chose to serve the most vulnerable New Yorkers. We deserve fair compensation for the public service we provide every day. Attorneys, support staff, supervisors, 
social workers, investigators, paralegals. That is why we are asking the city to provide parity with the law department in all of its legal services contracts. When I leave her in the mornings, my daughter knows that I'm going to work. But I want to be able to afford to continue working at Legal Aid when she's old enough to ask me what my work is. I want to be able to afford to continue working at Legal Aid when my daughter's ready to leave home for college. I want to be able to afford to continue working at Legal Aid when my daughter is deciding what kind of work she wants to do. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you again for holding this hearing. My name is Liz Bender. I am also a staff attorney at Legal Aid. Last week I celebrated the completion of my seventh year as a Legal Aid attorney. In each of those seven years, I have made less than the adversaries that I'm arguing against in court. For five years, I worked in the trial office in the Bronx, and now at the decarceration project, I litigate bail and policy and often advocate against corporation counsel lawyers. Again, I make less than my adversaries in each of those contexts. Uh, folks have rightly, rightfully pointed out today that the problem of the lack of pay parity is both systemic and personal. It's systemic because it affects all of our staff, not just the folks you're hearing from today. Paralegals, attorneys, social workers, investigators, administrators, all of whom are in court or in the office right now, um, making the Sixth Amendment a reality. Um, it's also been a problem for decades. Long before I joined Legal Aid, we weren't being paid enough. And as I mentioned, and as Chair Lansman, you mentioned, um, this problem and the lack of pay parity, it does impl implicate the Constitution. There's no constitutional mandate that we prosecute any one citizen and not another. There's certainly no, no constitutional mandate that we fill our jails with black and Latino men as a city that's almost half white. But there is a constitutional requirement that when we do prosecute and jail people, we give them a lawyer. And without us and our colleagues, that right has no meaning. And all we're asking for is to be treated as though our work is as valuable as that of ADAs and corporation counsel lawyers. Now, I want to talk about how this issue is personal for me. And there are two things I want to bring up. First is our lack of defined benefit pension. And second is just how having my salary impacts my day-to-day -day life. When I started in 2011, one of the first union meetings I can remember is one where our senior colleagues gathered us newbies around and tried to impart to us how important it was going to be to start thinking about retirement now. We were maybe a month on the job, and I don't think many of us were even 30 years old yet, but these attorneys wanted to have a face-to-face -face because they knew from experience, from their own, uh, you know, at, being at the end of their careers, knowing that no defined, pen defined benefit pension awaited them, that we would have to find some, way, uh, some other way to save for our retirement. That lesson has stayed with me, and I, I think about retirement all the time, even though it is, as Lily pointed out, decades away from me. All of us have told you today that we don't do this for the money, but what we mean by that is that we don't do it to get rich. I'm not asking you to make us rich. I'm asking you to pay me and my colleagues a salary that lets us live in the city that we've chosen to serve. I, like Lily, am the breadwinner in my family. My spouse works two jobs while he's getting his PhD at CUNY. One of those jobs is as an adjunct professor at City College where he teaches our city's youth. Now, I know that this is not a hearing about how CUNY pays its staff, although perhaps there should be one of those too. <laughs> but my point is that my family isn't unique. People who choose careers in service sometimes, often, choose each other. And what that means is that you have families that are built on public interest salaries who are scraping by. For us, one and a half public interest salaries plus wages from a restaurant job leave almost no room for saving, planning for retirement, or bracing ourselves for emergencies like the ones Paloma mentioned. Pay parity would help my family do both of those things. I really appreciate you holding this hearing and hearing from all of us today. I know that you take these demands seriously. I know that I've spoken to you both at a table like this and away from it um, about pay parity and the substance of our work. I know you value the service we provide, and I'm asking that our pay reflect that and that we get pay parity with Corporation Council. 
Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Drina Bellamy, and I'm the organizer for 1199. And um, I have, I know the issues that the 1199 members face, but just sitting here and listening to um, the attorney's um, issues is so disheartening because we're not on opposite sides, sides and we share the same views and we, ha we also share, um, we, 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 we always come together. But to know that you guys are struggling in a way um, and you are supposed to be at the top of your game as being attorneys, I mean, it's so disheartening. Like, I, I'm full, you know, just listening to you guys speak and would have never even known that. And so um, I come to say that the members, all these members, um, the attorneys, the paralegals, social workers, these members, they are, are the frontline administrative soldiers in this city fighting for criminal and social justice in New York City. And I find it quite disturbing that the members here, everyone that has spoken, that play an integral part of New York City major fundamental components can barely make ends meet and are struggling to take care of themselves and their families. And their financial crisis, crisis seems very similar to the clients they represent, which can be demoralizing to most. There are members from 1199 that work for legal aid, legal aid that are currently living in shelters, working two jobs, and some are able to receive food stamps, which means they are living at a poverty level as a result of not being able to afford the high cost, the, the, afford the high rising cost of rent, and most of them have high student loan debt. I testified at this hearing last year, and I stressed that the city cannot just count the amount of cases of the attorneys, because each case has several indiviz individuals attached to it. There's a support staff, there's a paralegal, there's a social worker, mitigation specialist, and the funding needs to reflect that. And I don't believe that the city realizes that, you know, when there's a, one case, all of these people are part of that one case, and it's not just a caseload of an attorney. Um, at chapter meetings um, with members, they're constantly expressing their frustration of being overworked and underpaid, with caseloads with case loads being exceedingly high because of legal aid inability to re retain staff because of the low wages, but continue to work exceedingly and above with new programs consistently being presented. The morale and the motivation is at an all low, and I find that the members are often angry with legal aid management, believing that they're responsible for the low wages, which causes division and dissension with the members and management. We are all aware of the increase in immigration legal status that have affected the lives of millions. When this happened, the members were very passionate about the situation and immediately took on the increased workload as a re result of the new Trump administrative immigration laws. Parity in pay is essential and should be considered to all of these members. This city would not be able to run without the due diligence and the work that legal aid staff and attorney attorneys provide to this city. I represent Criminal Justice Agency, and in the last two years, they received a 21% increase in wages because they were not being paid at the parity level that they, they should have been. Um, we did a wage reopener, and they received 11% last year. I just did a contract with them, and they gave them another 10% over the next three years. So I find that they're a city agency as well, so the city can find money to pay for these agencies that represent um, the clients in this city. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. My name is Adriana Matias. I'm a paralegal, too, at the Legal Aid Society. Um, I will make five years as of December 1st, uh, being a paralegal, too. I also am a union delegate for 1199 in uh, my organization. Uh, first, I'd like to start off by saying I love what I do. I love working with the community. I love helping clients. I am, it's so rewarding to hear a client say, thank you for helping me. I've, I've been through every, I've called so many agencies. I've been, doors have been closed in my face and thank you a lot for helping me. Also, um, while on intake, receiving walk-ins as well as phone calls, um, I receive those types of requests, but we also receive the requests of clients from 10, 15 years ago. Uh, once they are a client, they're always our client. So we continue to help them no matter how long ago we represented them. So in reference to caseload, as the other, my other colleagues has, has expressed, they may have a caseload, but it's ongoing because we still continue to represent them or assist our clients in any way possible. Being a union delegate as well, I hear a lot of stories from a lot of my colleagues um, from 1199, which, is, which consists of support staff, paralegal ones, paralegal two, social workers, and mitigation specialists. Everyone has the same story. They are unable to make ends meet. They all have, well, at most, I'm not gonna say all, but at most of, most of them have at least two jobs. It is frustrating that we work for such a prestigious public defender's office and we, we can't even depend on the salary that is provided to us by legal aid. Me personally, I have three jobs. I'm a full-time mother. I'm sending my child to college next year. And I would like to pursue and be a public defender and get my JD. How am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to tell my child, uh, you have to pick certain schools because I can't afford your tuition? These are the questions that I have. So I have to balance what I love to do, which is fighting for criminal justice and social justice, or take care of my family? That shouldn't be a question. As my colleague Paloma said, I wanna be a lawyer at Legal Aid, but those are the issues that I have to face. Those are the questions that are, gonna, that are arising for me. I've already asked those questions. Her and I have many conversations, as well as uh, a, lot of these, a lot of the attorneys on this panel. I seek <coughs> advice from them on how to do it and how is it to be an attorney at Legal Aid, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid to go ahead and pursue that because then I won't be able to provide for my family. That should never be a question um, because this is not just a job, this is a career. And, you know, there should never, you should never have to weigh out the option of should I pursue my career or be able to work three jobs to provide for my family? There should never be that question. Um, as a delegate, union delegate, I, have, I am on hiring committees, many hiring committee, committees throughout uh, criminal defense practice. Many people actually do not accept the position because of the salary. Many people paralegals, support staff, social workers, the retention rate is actually starting at two to five years, maybe 10. So they don't even make it past the five years because it's just not worth it, they feel. Thank you. Thank you. Akin, Akin Giola, I work at the Legal Aid Society. I'm a staff attorney just a few blocks away. I'm grateful for this chance to be heard on this important issue. Um, and I know I'm supposed to be advocating for public defenders to receive pay parity, but I would like to pose a question to the committee first. Why do you think our work as attorneys deserve less? 
I've been racking my brain to try to figure out how you would justify the disparity. And the only conclusion I can come to is that you don't value our clients and their constitutional rights to a defense. The district attorney's office, corporate counsel, they all graduated the same law schools that we did, passed the same bar, yet you value their work to put indigent New Yorkers, our clients, in cages over our efforts to provide our clients with a dignified quality representation that the Constitution demands. I took this job in 2013 at 28 fully aware that the pay would not be glamorous and that we wouldn't be getting paid what paid attorneys make. I knew my commitment to serve others, those born into severe poverty and fragile families, that was going to keep me motivated and dedicated to doing this job. That same commitment to others is what encouraged me to enlist the United States Navy when I was 18 and proudly serve this country by risking my life and well-being while spending more time in war zones than any person ever should. I grew up poor and on government assistance until my family was able to make it out. So I am very familiar with the plight of our clients and I love them. I may not like all of them, but I love all of them for their ability to survive and to not give up hope in a world that has given them less than nothing with very few opportunities to pull themselves out. I was able to make it out and this survivor's guilt that I live with hasn't allowed me to walk away from them, at least not yet. But after doing this job for five years, being 33, I'm not sure how much longer I can do this job for this salary. I wasn't born into money like many of our colleagues that had access, ability, and a privilege to attend law school because attending law school is a privilege. I have debt, only 100,000. I say only because there are colleagues that we worked with that have close to a quarter million dollars in debt. Our salary prevents me from living anywhere near work. For two years, I lived in New Jersey and commuted over 90 minutes away just so I could have affordable housing. This limited salary must be divided amongst paying loans, the high cost of New York City living, helping out my extended family, and having very little to save for my future which makes the idea of starting a family very daunting. This is not a nine to five job. The last two weeks I put in over 80 hours a week, barely slept four hours a night because I was on trial fighting for a client facing seven years in prison. Those hours I put in were not, you couldn't take any shortcuts, but I was able to help a man when the jury said not guilty. I'm 33 years old and I still am forced to live with two roommates. One happens to be another legal aid attorney and one happens to be a former legal aid attorney. The salary is forcing us to live like college students even though we each have advanced degrees and are highly skilled. And soon I'm going to have to make a decision like you heard before in this, that five year gap, five to 10 year gap between what I feel is my civic duty, my passion and my calling or a financially stable future and I shouldn't have to make that choice. And you have the ability to change that. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for your testimony. Um, I think it's very, very important to put the human face on the issues that we're talking about and the difficulties that all of you experience in performing such an extraordinarily vital function in our criminal justice system. As I said uh, to an earlier panel, the proof will be in the pudding. The legal aid and other public defender Contracts will hopefully be resolved soon. The mayor's budget will come out in February. I uh, invite you all to come and testify uh, at the March budget hearing, as is the, the ritual, and the public defenders and the, the union uh, delegates know very well. And we're going to do everything that we can to make sure that this year's budget reflects what I referred to earlier as the core value of making sure that our public defenders and our uh, prosecutors are paid uh, what they deserve. Thank you all very much. That concludes this hearing. Thank you. <laughs>